I um, I'm thankful to be here, and I do call the Lord my friend, and I feel like a favorite child of the Father, and I'm so happy to be in the midst of the people of God on, on the Sabbath. There's no better place to be than in the midst of God's people on the Sabbath on earth. The only place better would be in the midst of God in heaven. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to tell you, because the planning, we didn't know how much space was going to be needed, some of us with challenge, notice I said us, some of us who have challenge sight may want to move a little closer so you can see everything. And so I want to make sure that you don't miss a single thing. We cannot afford to miss anything in these last days. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. And so for those of you who do not know me, and there are many people here who I've met before, and it's a pleasure to see you again, but for those who have, who have not met me before, of course my name is Anthony Burns, and my wife, my lovely wife is Cheryl, and we are the Second Advent Messenger Ministry. Now unfortunately, brothers and sisters, when I speak, I like to get right into it. So I'm sorry I cannot give you a, a great introduction about myself, because it's not about me, it's about Christ. Amen? Amen? And so I want to ask you all to bow reverently with me that the Holy Spirit can, like it did on the, on the walk of the men who were walking to the road Emmaus with Jesus. I ask that each and every one of us will bow down and pray on our knees that the Holy Spirit will open up our learning, open up our understanding. We need to return to that primitive godliness, to that primitive Protestantism, that primitive Christianity that has long since been lost to the remnant church. And so I want to ask each and every one of you to bow down with me and ask the Holy Spirit to make an impression upon your hearts, upon your hearts. Brothers and sisters, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit that he could be able to communicate to each and every one of us where we are. And we need to ask today the Lord to send the Holy Spirit that he can communicate to us where each and every one of us are, that it can have an impression upon our hearts. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings of this, your Sabbath day. Lord, there's nothing that I have in my hands about me that is worth comparing to what you have done for me. So I ask, Father, that as I desire to be emptied of self, you would manifest thy grace in each and every one of us. Empty us up. Turn us over. Seal us that you can trust the latter rain upon each and every one of us. Remove any distractions. Speak to our hearts and through our hearts. Order our steps in your word is our prayer we ask. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I ask, with, I ask that each and every one of you now, again, I apologize if the fonts are not large enough, but I will ask each and every one of you to try to follow along with me. So if you will, if you will, let us start today. Let us start today with Revelation 13, 16, and 17. Revelation 13 and 16 and 17. Now we're going to, we're going to do a lot of studying today. A whole lot of studying. The good old ways it used to be done. We're going to open our Bibles. We're going to compare scripture with scripture. And we're going to look and see where we are in this earth's time. So if you will, Revelation 13, 16, and 17. Let me know you have it by saying amen. The Bible tells us in Revelation 13, 16, and 17, this is John speaking, he says, And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. We are very familiar with this. Many people in the world are familiar with this statement, but very few people are familiar with what this really tells us. My wife went to, 
two, we, we live in Lobelville, Tennessee, which is about, about an hour or so, hour and a half or so, east of Jackson, Tennessee. And my wife went to Jackson, Tennessee on Thursday. She had to get a, a couple of last, a last minute things for the trip. And as she went there, she went to one of the stores. I want, to let you, I want you to see how Revelation 13 and 16 and 17 are being fulfilled in front of your very eyes and you, most of us don't even know it. And so my wife went to the store and because she was gonna do a return, she took my debit card and gave me her debit card. So when she got to the store, she goes to the store with the debit card. And she goes and they say it was rejected. Now it's not a credit card, it's a debit card. So a debit card, as all of us know, you gotta have money in the bank. So you pretty much know if you have some money in the bank or not. But it was rejected. And so the, the cashiers allowed my wife to go ahead and write a check. Now most people are gonna be leery if your credit card or debit card rejects, then you probably don't have any money. Why are you taking the risk on buying, writing a check? But the cashier very, very amicably allowed my wife to write a check. And so when my, the, next day, the next morning when my wife mentioned that she said, well, your debit card was rejected. I said, well, why was it rejected? And she said, they didn't know it, they just rejected it. They didn't think it declined. It said rejected. And so we went to call the bank. And where we live, the reception is very, very poor. And sometimes we do have drop-offs. And she had been complaining that morning, saying that her cell phone was in the no service mode. And so I picked up mine. We were walking around the house to see if we could find a signal. And neither could I find a signal as well. And so I went ahead and called the bank on the house phone, the landline. And when I called the bank on the landline, they said, oh, for a while yesterday, Visa was down. I said, wow, wow. Didn't think twice about it. But then I looked at the cell phone, and the cell phone had on it, you can't see unfortunately, the cell phone had on it no service. And so I called AT&T and they said, the tower near you is down, down. And so I don't know, maybe you don't understand what was going on. I don't think you want it. Visa and AT&T were down. And when we look at Revelation 16 and 17, it says, and that no man might what? Buy or sell. My wife and I could not buy or sell in that instant. Just that quickly, we could not. We were shut down, not because we didn't have money. Not because our cell phone service had been disconnected, but because the system was down. Do you realize that at any moment, brothers and sisters, the system can be down for those who will not accept the mark of the beast? That's where we, that's not where we're going to, that's where we are. See, you and I have been conditioned to believe that it's out there. No, beloved, it's right here. At any moment, it can be shut down. I don't believe that you understand what I'm saying. I, I think that you, have, it has not made the impression upon your heart. So let, let's try something else. Let's try something else. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 16, 1 through 3. Matthew 16, 1 through 3. I'm not sure if you're clear of what's really happening in the world today and how it's going to affect or how it's affecting See, we have come to the conclusion that, oh, it's just a bump in the road. But brothers and sisters, that bump is going to become a canyon to the people of God very, very soon. The Bible tells us in Matthew 16, 1 and 3, are you there? The Bible says, here's Matthew speaking. Matthew walked with, the, walked with Jesus. The Bible says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he should he should he would show them a sign from heaven he answered and said unto them when it is eaten you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering oh ye hypocrites ye can discern the face of the sky but can ye not discern the signs of the time. Can you and I discern what's happening and say, we are in a crisis. We are in a crisis, not out there, but right now in each and every one of our lives. Our opening scripture that says, and he called us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand. That scripture right there is real time for each and every one of us. 
not for just me and my wife, but for you as well. They can shut down your bank account now. Literally, that was shut down. She could not buy. Thank goodness she had gas in the car because we were told by the bank that Visa was down. Pretty soon, even your cash will be of no avail. Pretty soon. You're going to have to pay attention to the screen to the best of your abilities, brothers and sisters, because you're going to see a lot of what's happening in the world right up here, right up here on the screen. These things are happening before your eyes, so to give you an idea how, why I use presentations, I, I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, can, turn with me, if you will, go back, go back to Revelation 13, 16, and 17, Revelation 13, 16 and 17. Revelation 13, 16 and 17. And when you're there, again, we want to make sure we got this, we got this and understand this. Verse 17. Let's just skip to verse 17. We know what 16 says, right? 17 says, and that no man, that also includes human, so you woman are included in the man. So don't be mistaken. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that have the mark of the beast. You need to be clear. And the reason why I use presentations like this because I want to make an impression. I want you to see that these are not Brother Burns' words. I don't want you to walk away from here saying Brother Burns said this because brothers and sisters what happens is when you say Brother Burns it becomes my doctrine. The doctrines of men. I don't want these to be the doctrines of men. Sister White tells us to use these type of measures to make an impression upon men's hearts. She tells us this in the last volume of testimonies to the churches, she says, by the use of charts, symbols, and representations of various kinds, the minister can make the truth stand out what? Clearly and distinctly. So what you see up here is what is written. I will not give you anything that comes just from what I put together. It has to be what you can, and I would advise you, be a Berean, write and go and see if what I say, what I present, is fact, not what I say is what Brother Burns thinks, because I'm not going to put these together in such a way where you're going to say he twisted the scriptures. No, we're going to see with our own eyes. We need to understand the signs of the times. And so we're going to do, and I already used up about eight minutes. I'm very, very cognizant of the time. And so we're going to talk about the signs of the times. So this morning we're going to talk about the evangelical church. Woo! If you have not been aware of what the evangelical church is doing in America and in other countries in the world, you're asleep, but we hope to wake you up today. And then this, after, this next presentation after this, we're going to focus on the effects that e Islam is having on a global basis as well. We're going to do both of those things, and then we're going to finish up this, after this evening, if, the Lord, if by the Lord's will, we're going to finish up on the message of righteousness by faith. So I have three talks. And for those of you who have mentioned to me that they've seen these on, online, I'm going to try to cover three five DVD series and, three, and just three talks. How am I going to do that? Only by the grace of God. And so we need to understand that it all, everything about it, everything about this talk is about the essentials of righteousness by faith. Moving God's people from where they are to having the righteousness by faith that each and every one of us must have before Jesus comes. If you and I do not have Christ's righteousness, we will not be saved. I'm going to build on the prophecies only to get us to the point where we understand that righteousness by faith has to be the most important issue in our lives today. Now many will say, well what about prophecy? Prophecy is a road map. Prophecy can show me how to get to the Frisbee's home, but it doesn't tell me how to act when I get into the Frisbee's house. Hello? I can have a wonderful diet, but it doesn't tell me how to act in the Frisbee's home. I can understand and keep the commandments. I can be legalistic, but it doesn't tell me how to act in the Frisbee's home. So unless we understand that there is a sleeping giant inside of each and every one of us, 
And that sleeping giant, see, when I was in the world, and those, of the, 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 those who have seen videos that I've done know that I was involved in Amway. I was involved in multi-level marketing. And they talked about unleashing the giant inside of you. Unleash the giant inside of you. No, brothers and sisters, the giant inside of you is your faith. That's the giant that God wants to unleash inside of each and every one of us. So we're going to, this whole objective of this is to make sure that our character is prepared for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's the most important thing. And so if you will, turn with me to Revelation 16 and 15. Revelation 16 and 15. And when you're there, say amen. All right, I heard someone say amen, so let's keep going. The Bible tells us here, John is talking, but he's talking about what Jesus says in Revelation. He says, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Because when you're watching, you're preparing. You're watching because you know something is coming. And does what? Keepeth his garment. See, that garment is not your garment. It's the garment of Christ's righteousness. That's the garment that we're trying to get. And we have to keep that garment because without Christ's righteousness, we are like the man in the wedding, at the wedding supper in Matthew 22, when the king came or when the householder came, he was found to be what? Naked. Now he had on a garment, but whose garment was it? His own garment. And in having his own garment, he was naked before God's eye. And so the Bible tells us, Paul, John says, and blessed is he that keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So the objective of righteousness by faith is to have Christ's covering. That our shame or our sinful nature, remember when Adam sinned, he, was, he became ashamed. One sin made him ashamed. How many sins do we have that we should be ashamed of? Every single one. And so the Lord tells us, I come quickly. He says, I come quickly. I'm going to skip only because, and you know me, those who do know me know that I have so much to cover. But Jesus says he comes quickly. And so by the time this happens, by the time this happens, by the time we see Jesus come quickly, our characters have to have already been ready. We can't wait to see that and say, oh, let me get it together. Oops. We can't even wait until the, na- we can't wait till the National Sunday Law comes because the sense of urgency that we're going to need to have is going to be so overwhelming that we won't be able to think straight. We need to get those characters together right now. Do you agree? We're, this is you and I right now. We are, there's Jesus. He's between the Father and you and I. But one day he's going to step away from between the Father and you and I. One day, we don't know how soon, but the signs of the time tell us that that's getting ready to happen. And when he steps from between the Father and us, there's going to be no intercessor, and we're going to have to have his character in order for us not to be consumed by God's righteousness. That is the objective with this series, that is our objective now. Not just this series, but that is our objective now. And so if you will, turn with me to Revelation 22, 11, and 12. Revelation 22, 11, and 12. And when you're there, say amen. The Bible tells us in Revelation 22, 11, and 12. Here is that, that sign. Here is that picture that we saw. Jesus have is come. And so Jesus, in this particular instance, John is explaining Jesus, he says, He that is unjust, verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. At that particular point, you are on the right side with the sheep and the lambs, or you are on the left side with the goats. You are either prepared on the right or unprepared on the left. Amen? Amen. Verse 12 says, And behold, I come, there's that word again, quickly, and my reward is with me. My reward, or Jesus' reward, is that which you have done. The wages of sin is death, or what? Or the gift of God is... That's the reward. Is there any other reward? Is there middle ground? No. No. 
We want the gift of God. Amen? My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. And so let's look at a comprehensive or a comparative line. I want you to make sure you have Revelation 22, 11, and 12 in your notes because now I'm going to give you a, a complimentary note or complimentary scripture that goes smack dab along with this. Turn with me, if you will, to Daniel 12, 1 and 2. Same situation. Same situation because by the time Revelation 22, 11 and 12 happens, or by the time Daniel 12 and 1 happens, it is too late. Amen? Let's make sure we understand this. Daniel 12, 1 and 2. I didn't turn my page, so just bear with me for just a second. I was talking. Daniel 12, 1 and 2. The Bible tells us in Daniel 12, 1 and 2. And at that time, at that time, he that is unjust, filthy, who filthy, righteous, and holy, at that time, that's the same time, at that time shall Michael stand up. The great prince would stand before the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So where you are in Revelation 22, 11 and 12, or Daniel 12 and 1, where you are is where you are. Do you want to be prepared for Daniel 12 and 1 and Revelation 22, 11 and 12, or do you want to wait? Do you want to wait? We want to be prepared, don't we? And so we need to understand what it means to be prepared because these two lines, John and Daniel, everything has to be based upon preparing for this event. Everything. Turn with me if you will. Turn with me if you will to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah explains it clearly so we can continue to move on. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. And when you're there, say amen. I heard enough amens. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So God is in the process right now of raising up to David a righteous branch, a group of people, a collection, a remnant, as it were and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Isn't that the reward? Is that not the reward that Jesus is going to bring with him? The justice for those who are filthy, unjust? There's going to be some type of reward, whether it's the reward you want or the reward you don't want. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's what it all means. When this happens, when judgment has been executed, will you be collected, will you be part of the collection that can have the seal of the living God on your forehead and be called the Lord our righteousness because God is not going to see you and me. He needs to see, in order for us to be allowed into heaven, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's the objective. And so unless we understand what righteousness by faith is, we can never be. Sister White puts it this way, and this is speaking to you and me. As Christ's ambassadors, this is in the 1888 messages. She says, as Christ's ambassadors, they, speaking of us, are to search the scriptures to seek for the truth that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. Rubbish of error. She is not talking about the world, beloved. She's talking about the church. The 1888 message was not a campground meeting for the world. It was for the church. So she's saying that some rubbish of error had come in. And every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. We need to get the truth, make sure it is the truth, and then communicate it to others. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. See, Paul saw this. Paul understood it. Paul understood the condition that there was rubbish in Israel. 
There was rubbish. It was the rubbish that caused Jesus to be crucified. It was the error that had come into Israel from 400 years of association with the Greeks. It was rubbish. It was rubbish, brothers and sisters. It was that which made even Peter willing to kill for Jesus because of the error that had come in. And Paul was willing to kill. In fact, Paul did kill because of the rubbish that he had learned. Did he not? And so this rubbish, brothers and sisters, we have to get it out of our lives because until, as Jesus says to, to Peter, when thou art converted. See, Peter was willing to kill for Christ. Paul was willing to kill for the Sanhedrin. Until we get to the point that we are more willing to die than to break a law, we are not converted. That's even the little lies, the gossip, any little thing about, any little thing that we know that we could not do with Jesus sitting right beside us, those things have to be cast in the dust in order for us to have that conversionary experience. Paul realized that he had been following rubbish. He realized that he had been following, and the men unfortunately didn't know. 400 years of miseducation, sooner or later, those who started the miseducation die off, and another generation, they die off, and before you know it, it's not really miseducation anymore, it's just we didn't know. And Paul didn't know, and brothers and sisters, this rubbish, the majority of Seventh-day Adventism doesn't know is rubbish. They won't, we don't know. It came into the church after the last pioneer died in 1926. When J. M. Loughborough died, there was a change that came into the church. We'll talk about that if I ever come here again. I, I just don't have enough time to talk about every single thing. But after J. M. Loughborough died, changes came into the church in terms of how the church would interpret prophecy and history. And from that point on, that's how the educational system has been. And so when you come in and you try to bring truth that is a part of true Seventh-day Adventism, primitive godliness, you are looked upon as Jesus was looked upon by the Sanhedrin. It's the truth. Paul saw this, and he didn't want anything else to do with the leaders. Read in Acts of the Apostle from persecutor to disciple. Paul wanted nothing else to do. But we're not in that type of time now, brothers and sisters. There are still those that are in the church that we need to seek the lost and grab, grab them in as well. Amen? Amen. Sister White tells us in Acts of the Apostles, in that chapter, on from persecutor to disciple, it says, the prayers of the penitent Pharisee were not in vain. Speaking of Paul, the inmost thoughts and emotions of his heart were transformed by grace. And his nobler faculties were brought into harmony. See, Paul, Paul was zealous, but he was zealous for error. I've been zealous for error. Has anyone ever been zealous for error? You didn't know it was error, but it was, you were zealous nonetheless, correct? So Paul was, Peter was zealous for error, wasn't he, when he tried to kill the God? Wasn't that error because he thought that he could, he thought he could do something for God. What can you do for God? And his nobler faculties, speaking of Paul, were brought into harmony with the eternal purposes of God. Christ and his righteousness became to Saul, converted to Paul, more than the whole world. The righteousness. See, Paul had, Paul had a righteousness, but it was a righteousness by works. He figured that if he made the Sanhedrin happy, it would sooner or later move him up to a higher position. That was by works. That's merit, right? But it was not that type of righteousness. It's not that type of righteousness that we are to have. We need the righteousness of Christ. Christ had manifested his righteousness throughout his work. And when Peter was trying to, wanted to kill the God, that guard, G-U-A-R-D, Jesus manifests his righteousness by putting the ear back on. Paul was trying to kill, and Jesus was trying, excuse me, Peter was trying to kill, and Jesus was healing. In fact, scripture confirms that Paul made it known. He made it clearly known in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you save or except Jesus and him crucified. So Paul saw that he had been taught rubbish and error. 
It wasn't that the truth was not there, but it had been hidden. Years of Greek education had suppressed the Old Testament. And after all those years, centuries actually when you count from the time beginning of the Greeks, it was 400 years the Bible tells us, doesn't it? So 400 years of a pre or suppression of the truth, eventually that to Paul, no, he didn't even know what it was until he was knocked down and realized that, wait a minute, what I have been told by the leaders is not what is in Scripture. See, we have to be careful that what you are told by someone up here, including yours truly, is not something that goes against the, lie, the word of God. That's why we say, be a Berean. It's not just a catchphrase. It is the truth. Because if you are not a Berean, your doctrine is going to be based on the doctrines of men. And Jesus says, in vain do they worship me for teaching for doctrines of men, the traditions. And that's what we have to be careful of. And so Paul says, he preached Jesus and him crucified. We need the robe of Christ's righteousness, and we need it right now. How can we get this righteousness? How can we get that righteousness? And I'm not even halfway through. How can we get that righteousness? Beloved, that's not an easy question. The answer is simple, but the question, or the answer to the question, is not easy. Because Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, he tells us in the Gospel of Matthew 24 and 24, Matthew 24 and 24, Matthew 24, Jesus says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So, Jesus warns us about a false or false prophets that would come in the end of time. We already know that they are here. Let's see how close we are to those false prophets. Turn with me to Revelation 13 and 13. Revelation, th remember, we're looking at this issue of the evangelicals, and now we're bringing it down to the idea of false prophets. Revelation 13 and 13. We do not want to be deceived because there's a true righteousness and there's a false, right, false righteousness. And there are those today that are thinking they're doing things for God, and if they succeed in it, they think that that's going to prove that they're righteous. But Jesus says, beware of false... That's quite all right. Jesus wants us to know that there will be false righteousness. And we're seeing it right now. But Revelation 13 and 13 says, And he deceiveth, excuse me, and he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And does what? Am I here by myself? Come on, let's we gotta be here together. We come here to learn. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Pause. Did Jesus say something about miracles or deceptions in the last times? Yes. And so this lines up with it, but let's see how far or how in depth this lines up with it. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And so Jesus says he Paul, I mean, John tells us in reference to this false prophet, he would deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. Question, question, who is he? Who is he in Revelation 13 and 13? That's a question. Does anyone know? Say it. We're among brothers and sisters. I expect to see each and every one. I want to see each and every one of you in heaven, so feel comfortable with me. Who is he in Revelation 13 and 13? Somebody say it. Church and state. Church and state. Let's be sure. Let's be sure. Let me read it again. You, you don't need to guess at this. Because all you need to do is go back two lines of scripture to Revelation 13 and 11. Revelation 13 and 11. Let's go back to that. Revelation 13 and 11. And let's see who this is. Revelation 13 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. Who is that beast? United States. United States, right? 
So we're continuing on in this line of scripture. So by the time we get to 13, well, by the time you get to 13, the United States is coming under the control of the fallen Protestant churches. Amen. And so the fallen Protestant church is working in cahoots with the United States. The Bible says, and uh, that he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the, on, on the earth and the sight of men. So he is a combination of church and state, where is the, whereas the fallen Protestant churches are under, have under their control the U.S. government. Are we clear? Are we clear? You need to know this. I'm getting this, this answer. We got to be 100% sure. We need to be 100% sure. He, let's read verse 13 again. And he, put in place of that he, church and state in the United States. And the church and the state in the United States does great wonders so that church and state make its fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which the church and state had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Does that make sense? That that's the United States? Amen? amen. I'm still not hearing a, a resounding amen here. We need to be sure. We are in the preparation time. And if you don't see what's happening, then you think you have more time. I need to make sure, we need to make sure that we see things happening so that our characters, we start seeing another event. Oh, I got to stop getting upset. I got to stop showing my anger. I got to, I got not just showing anger, I got to stop being angry. Because when you have the truth, you can afford to be calm. When you have the truth, you don't have to show any anxiety. The truth, there's only one truth. There are thousands of lies, but there's only one truth. Amen. Let's find out for sure. So, the, one of the, so in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, but more specifically in Revelation 13 and 3, the he is the United, United States under the control of the fallen Protestant churches. Now, now, because according to the scripture, he is going to have a lot of power, He's going to have a lot of power, amen? amen? Because he's going to have an overarching power of deception, we must know who he is. Is he going to have more power or does he now have more power? Mm. Does he, is he going to have more power or does he now have more power? The Bible, when John wrote this, this was in 90 AD. The Bible says going to, but we're in the end of time, so is he going to or does he now have more power? Let's see. Let's see. Let's go back. Let's see. Let's see. If you will, the Bible tells us in Revelation 13, 11, and 12. Revelation 13, 11, and 12. You should be there because we were just there a few moments ago. Revelation 13, 11, and 12. And the Bible says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spake as a, what? Dragon. Okay. That over there is the buffalo. The buffalo used to be the mascot for the United States, but, and that's what the, most people in the United States, but according to scripture, according to scripture, that coming up as a lamb and speak as a dragon to, speaks to the character of the United States when it first came up, because the United States came up speaking of separation of church and state. Remember when John saw Jesus, he said, Lo, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the earth, because Jesus manifested or spoke of separation. You render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, render unto God that which is God. Separation of church and state. And so this scripture tells us in Revelation 13, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He spake as a dragon, and he's speaking as a dragon. And so we see today, as we're going to see in just a few moments, the evangelical churches of America speaking through the United States government as a dragon. How do nations speak? Through their laws, through their legislation. Amen? Some of these things I cannot give you, I cannot put up here because I will never get finished. So I'm only making the assumption that as Seventh-day Adventists you'll go back and see if what I'm saying you can prove through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So when a nation speaks, it speaks through its legislative body. Amen? 
Okay, so when we look at who he is, he is the United States under the control of the all the Protestant churches and today those are the fallen apostate Protestant churches who don't even call themselves Protestants anymore. They call themselves evangelicals. What is his other name? What is his other name? Turn with me if you will to Revelation 16 and 13. Just a couple of pages up. Revelation 16 and 13. Revelation 16 and 13, the Bible says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. We need to come to a complete understanding that the he in Revelation 13 and 13 and the false prophet are the same entity. Amen? Are we sure? Okay, I heard someone say positive, and he shook his head like a positive. I'm, you can't change me on that. And we have to be just that adamant about it. You cannot change us. We should be able to tell why this Revelation 16 and 13, false prophet, and the he in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, is the United States under the control of the fallen Protestant churches. Why is he called the false prophet? Why is he called the false prophet? Now this is when it gets a little tight here. Why is the fallen, why are the fallen Protestant churches called the false prophet? Because they mix truth with error. They've been doing it for a long, long time. But in modern times, let's see how they mix truth with error. Now, we know who this is. I, I see your head shaking. But let's see what he says as he mixes truth with error. As a result of extensive ecumenical dialogue, it states that the churches now share a common understanding of our justification by God's grace through faith in Christ. To the parties involved, this essentially resolves the conflict over the nature of justification which was at the root of the Protestant Reformation. The protest is over. I, folks, I'm telling you, this, this is powerful, powerful stuff. Now, take a good look at that picture. The night before, we had a dinner together before we met with, the, with Pope Francis the next day. That many evangelicals in one room. <laughs> uh, folks, you don't get it. See that? They, what did he just say? The protest is over. See, he says to them, I don't think you get it. But I don't think he gets it. I don't think he gets it. Because for him to make the statement that that many evangelicals in the room getting prepared to meet with the Pope, to declare that the protest is over. Let me tell you something about the protest and what it means to be a Protestant. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us in, 18, in Review and Herald, June 1st, 1886, Review and Herald, 1886, June 1st, the prophet says, Christ was a Protestant. Protestant. Amen. Yeah. And I don't think you heard what she wrote. So the protest is over? Does that make him a true prophet? I mean, a true prophet or a false prophet? No, does that make the, what he said, what Copeland said, when he said the protest is over, does that make him a true Protestant? Or true, excuse me, true prophet? Because the prophet says that Christ was a Protestant. And as long as Christ, as long as Christ is up there, Waiting for a people to be made up, Christ will be a Protestant. The protest is not over, so for someone to say that the protest is over shows that they are a false prophet. He, Christ, protested, protested against the formal worship of the, Jew, worship of the Jewish nation who rejected the counsel of God against themselves. He told them that they taught for doctrines the commandments of men and that they were pretenders and hypocrites. 
Like lighted sepulchres, they were beautiful without, but within, full of impurity and corruption. The reformers date back to Christ and his apostles. They came out, of a, came out and separated themselves from a religion of form and ceremonies. Luther and his followers did not invent the reformed religion. They simply accepted it as, a, as presented by Christ and the apostles. The Bible is presented to us as a sufficient guide, but the Pope and his workers removed, remove it from the people as if it were a curse because it exposes their pretenses and rebukes their idolatry. That's the same thing that's happening. And so we see today, we see today that the modern Protestant, fallen Protestant evangelical churches are now all getting their doctrines from the Roman Catholic system. They are false, if, you, if this is where your doctrines come from, you have to be a false prophet at very best. Amen. On your best day, you're a false prophet. If you don't, if, if, if you have a question about this, go back and study the Blair Bill, and then study the Chicago Exposition or the um, Breckenridge Bill, and that's in Verit Angel's Messages, 1893 by A.T. Jones, in terms of talking about the first sun National Sunday Law that was actually passed. And who was behind it? It was the fallen Protestant churches. And so when we look at this idea that the evangelicals think that the, pro the Reformation is over or the or Protestant or the protest is over, let's see what A.T. Jones says about this. No, excuse me. Let's see what David Hunt said about this in 1994. I don't typically quote anyone who's not a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't typically quote, but this was just too spot on for me to leave it out there. He says, there is a growing trend among today's who? Evangelicals. He's differentiating here, beloved. Here's a non-Seventh-day Adventist who differentiates between evangelicals and Protestants. And he's going to do it this way. There's a growing trend among today's evangelicals to embrace and promote a benign view of the Romanism that contradicts the convictions held by Protestants for more than 400 years. So the evangelicals, they, go, they have lined up with, with Romanism to contradict Protestantism. That's why they can make the statement the, pro the protest is over. The Reformation, if remembered at all, is being portrayed as unnecessary separation from a church which was biblical and evangelical. Statements by various evangelicals today impugn the faith and convictions of millions of martyrs who died rather than accept transubstantiation, purgatory, indulgences, worship of saints, and the remainder of Rome's false and destructive gospel of rituals and works. A Woman Rides the Beast, 1994 by David Hunt, page 389. Again, I don't quote a lot. I quote very little that's outside of the church, but this is, this is worth you seeing. Because here's a true Protestant or someone who is living up to the knowledge or living up to what they know and they see this disconnect in the evangelicals and seeing the evangelicals move closer to Romanism and he says something is wrong here. He continues and this is a quote that I got from that same article. He says, this is a quote from Paul Crouch of the Trinity Broadcasting Network back in 1989 to show you how long this thing has been moving along. Paul Crouch says, I'm eradicating the word Protestant even out of my vocabulary. I'm not protesting anything. It's time for Catholics and non-Catholics to come together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. So this has been just gaining steam, gaining steam. And again, we see from Robert Schuller, he's still around. He says, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope and say, what do we have to do to come home? Robert Schuller, 1987. Mercy. So here we are 20 something years, to almost actually 30 years, 31 years out, and this is just, this now it's, they're bold about it. And you're gonna see how bold they are in just a couple of moments. Here we have Billy Graham, I do apologize that the slide is a little bit off. Billy Graham says, I found that my beliefs are essentially the same as those of Orthodox Roman Catholics. 1978. 
This has been moving, brothers and sisters. We don't see the signs of the time because we think it's out there. It's been here in front of our faces. And then we see the president or former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, W.A. Criswell says, I do not know anyone, a Baptist saying this, I do not know anyone more dedicated to the great fundamentalist doctrines of Christianity than the Catholics. Finally, Billy Graham's statement again says, Pope John Paul, the greatest religious leader of the modern world. This is what the evangelical churches are seeing. And they've all changed their names. Evangelical Presbyterian Church, founded in 1847? I, 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 I doubt. Evangelical Methodist Church, Evangelical Lutheran Church, Evangelical Christ, Church of Christ, on and on and on, the evangelicals, brothers and sisters, have proved that evangelicals are not Protestants. But remember, turn back with me if you will, turn back with me if you will, to Revelation 13. Turn back, let's look now. Revelation 13, are we there? Verse 12 says, and he exercised this, who is he again? Fallen Protestantism, a.k.a. also known as evangelicals. Okay? Verse 12 says, 13 and 12 says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and then was dwelt therein to worship the first beast whose daily wound was healed. And so now we can look and see the evangelicals are defined in scripture as having power, but the issue is, because I didn't, get an, I didn't get a hearty amen, do they have power now, or are they going to have power in the future? That was what I'm trying to prove in this particular part of the segment, amen? Do they have the power, right? President Trump is giving a heads up today to the leader of the Palestinian Authority that he intends to move the U.S. Emb embassy, rather, in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now this despite calls from several American allies to halt those plans. A spokesman for President Mahmoud Abbas says he warned President Trump today dangers uh, are afoot of steps like that and the Palestinian leaders are adamant that such a move would be a violation of international law. A source tells CNN the White House is expected to announce plans tomorrow to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. For President Trump, it's a campaign promise he hopes to show that he is keeping. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. Now that was candidate Trump. It's worth pointing out that this promise has been fulfilled by no U.S. presidents, even though many of them have made that very same promise. CNN's Ian Lee is watching the story from Jerusalem. He joins me live. Uh, Ian, what are they saying over there? Well, Dana, people are bracing for this announcement. Now, we need to note that the president hasn't said it yet, but people here are acting like he, he is or he's about to because we do have the Palestinians uh, saying that they're going to continue to work with regional leaders to help put the pressure on President Trump. We're also hearing from the Jordanians who said that President Trump also had a conversation with King Abdullah. And in that conversation, King Abdullah warned of the dangers of any decision without a comprehensive peace deal. Uh, he went on to say that uh, he stressed that the adoption of this decision will have serious ramifications and implications on the security and stability in the Middle East. And this is something, though, that we've heard not just from the Jordanians, but also from the Saudis, from the Egyptians, uh, other leaders in the region who are really worried what this could mean uh, for stability and security if the United States makes this move. And it's just not leaders in this region. We also know that uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has reached out to the president to uh, warn him about making such a, a unilateral move. Uh, but we need to note that the Israeli officials, they have advocated for this for a long time. Both the defense minister and the mayor of Jerusalem have welcomed a potential decision. Dana. Ian Lee, thank you so much for that report. Back around the table, Olivia, you know, you, you've done uh, some extensive reporting on this. What is your sense, not to put you on the spot, but I'll put you on the spot. Sure. 
is it I intend to move it or it's going to move on this date and the, the, the ground is going to be broken on this date and here are my plans? So there are two separate issues. They're very closely related, but they're separate. One is this is on the table now because there's a U.S. law from the Clinton era that mandates the move from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem unless the president waives it. And they waive it in six-month increments. That's why this is on the table now. The deadline technically was yesterday. Um, the second issue, which is the more interesting one now, is the one where he looks like he actually is shifting American policy, which is formally recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That's a, that's a notable shift. But all this talk about how he's, he's telling these leaders that he intends to move the embassy, that's U.S. law. Mm -hmm. Unless we get a date certain, nothing has changed there. The recognition is significant, and there's something to watch here. Will he or any senior officials talk about what this means for the future, for the capital of a future and still very hypothetical mm -hmm. Palestinian state? Because the, the main fight here is... Israel has always claimed Jerusalem as its capital, but the Palestinians have claimed uh, East Jerusalem as the capital of their, again, hypothetical future state. That's really the thing to watch here. Is he actually going to announce a groundbreaking, mm -hmm. or is he going to kick the can down the road? Is he going to say, I'm commissioning a study to determine where and when we could groundbreak? Those are two very different issues. Um, I will note that, uh, that our reporting at Yahoo News, my, my colleague Hunter Walker, has unearthed the fact that the White House notified um, some allied evangelical leaders before they notified some senior State Department officials, which is telling you something about the, the, the grounds for this decision. Uh, but what Did you hear that? Did you understand what he said? Does anyone understand what he said? He said that before the president announced the decision, he communicated or he talked to whom? Come on, brothers and sisters, we have to be on the same page on this. He notified evangelical leaders. But who did he notify the evangelical leaders before? Before members of the State Department. See, when I talk, when I talk to people in other countries, they're dazzled. They're like, well, what does this mean? They have no idea because they, don't, they just don't understand the United States policy or civics. But as Seventh-day Adventists who are supposed to understand civics, and supposed to understand how government runs, you and I need to know that no president should contact a church and say, this is what I'm going to do, what are your thoughts? That's what you have a State Department for. That's what you have a Secretary of State for. You talk to him or her first. Then you talk to whomever else you decide to talk to. The commentator said before the president talked to the, talked to the State Department, he talked to the evangelicals. I asked a question earlier. I said, are they going to have power or do they have power now? They have power now. They have power now. Has anyone in here ever played chess? All right. This is a chessboard up in front of me, up on the side of me. You see the chessboard? Okay, what are these two pieces beside the king and the queen? This is the, the chessboard was based upon the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, who are the two pieces between, beside, this is the king and this is the queen, or queen and king. Oh, what did you say, sister? Bishops. Bishops. And so the, ch the chessboard was a representation or is a representation of the Holy Roman Empire which meant every time a king or a queen made a decision, who did they notify first? Brothers and sisters, who did, who did Trump notify first? Is the fallen Protestant or are the evangelicals riding the beast? Is it happening right now or is it in the future? Let's see for sure. This is the, this is the evangelical church and there the, the, the Protestant, fallen Protestant churches, the false prophet is now riding or controlling. You can see it with your own eyes. But Jesus says we can't see the signs of the times. They're happening. They're in front of our face. See, in the old world, the beast was Europe being ridden by the Protestant, excuse me, by the papacy. In the new world, the image to the beast which is the U.S. government, all three branches, all three branches. Neil Gorsuch was not going to be a chosen Supreme Court justice unless the evangelicals recommended him. And I got news for you, brothers and sisters, neither was Alito, neither was Roberts. They were all chosen by the religious right. All chosen. And how about Kavanaugh? Same thing. We are there. And so the fallen 
evangelical churches now have made an image to the beast. It's not out there. The visa shut down. The telephone shut off. It's not out there. It's smack dab in our face. And we're in preparation time. And unless we see this as preparation time, brothers and sisters, we're going to keep thinking, we're going to keep having our doctrines buried under the rubbish of error. We're waiting for someone to tell us, oh, you got to do this. See, I heard an official say that there is no national Sunday law in the pipeline. I heard that this year. Did anyone else hear that? I saw the video. No national Sunday law. A national Sunday line has been in, law has been in the pipeline since 1880. Eight. It's in front of our faces. That's why we have to build. That's why I have to take this case and build so you can see how close it is. So when we get to the topic of righteousness by faith, you will understand not, it's not my husband that causes problems for me. It's me causing problems for me. It's not my wife causing problems for me. It's me causing problems for me. It's my character. It's not my children. It's, not my, it's no one but me. Not my mother, not my father. It's me, oh Lord. I'm in the need of his righteousness. And these events, these very events were forecast to happen. Jesus tells us in Matthew, excuse me, in John 14, 29. John 14 and 29. Jesus tells us in John 14 and 29. When you're there, say amen. John 14 and 29. I heard one amen. I wait for one more and I'm ready. John 14 and 29. Jesus says, and now I have told you what? Before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, what? Do you believe yet? Do you believe yet? Do you believe we're close? Because when you turn, just turn back, go back to the Old Testament to Amos 3, 7. Amos 3 and 7. You all know this. Surely the Lord God will do what? Nothing. But he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. He's getting ready to do something. The Lord is getting ready to do something and he's revealing it to you. This movement was a movement based on prophecy. And his servants are those who believe in the prophetic word. Before this church had a prophet, we had prophecy. Oh, you doubt? Josiah Litch? Revelation 9, 13 through 15? Was Sister White a prophet at the time? Was the Ottoman Empire fall of the Ottoman Empire? Was that not a prophecy? Was that not a prophecy that we as a the people who had not become a church yet, that was a prophecy that springed us, springboard us from obscurity to prominence. We didn't have a prophet yet. We were a prophetic movement. But to make the prophetic movement keep moving, God gave us a prophet. And so now we should understand that the prophecies that are being revealed right in front of our eyes, God is telling us these very things to say, you are my servants. Notice the prophecies. Take them to heart. Hide my word in your, in your hearts that you might not, that you will not sin against me. The Lord is making things clearer to us. But we keep waiting for someone else to tell us. We were at one time called the people of the book. Now we're just called people. We have to get back to this book. And as I, as I look at the things that... How many, of you, how many of you have email? Email. How many of you have email? Wow, that's great that most of you don't. But how many of you get an email almost every single day about the papacy? from some well-meaning Seventh-day Adventist who want to tell you all the things that the papacy is doing. The Pope is doing this. The Pope is doing that. Francis is doing this. The Vatican, this, that, and the other. We have become so inundated and so idolatrous of the papacy that all we want to hear about is what the papacy is, do is going to do. God has told us that the papacy is going to be destroyed beginning in the fifth plague and at the seventh plague. You cannot destroy the papacy. All you, can re all you can do is reveal. That's all you can do. And guess what, brothers and sisters? You can only barely do that because it wasn't the Seventh-day Adventists who revealed that the papacy is having all these pedophilia problems. It's the media. God says, I'm going to expose them. You expose my character. You show my character. And so the prophet tells us this. She says, there is, a, there is, there is need of a much closer study of the word of God. 
Especially should Daniel and the Revelation have attention as never before in the history of our work. That's why we can't see the signs. Because it's right here in Scripture. But we can't see it. And she's going to explain to you us why we can't see it. We may have less to say in some lines what? In regard to the Roman power and the papacy, but we should call attention to what the prophecies and apostles have written under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. You would think the book of Revelation was all about the papacy. It's not. It's not. It's about God's church. <laughs> it's about God's church. Daniel is not about the papacy. Daniel is about world empires. We have become so overwhelmed. We are we, we're starting to make ourselves, the Bible says, by beholding we become changed. We're starting to act like it. We have to divert our attention from error and bring it back in line with primitive godliness or truth. Amen. She says the Holy Spirit has so shaped matters both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed as to teach that the human agent is to be kept out of sight, hid in Christ, and the Lord God of heaven and his law are to be exalted. Finally, look at this. So, so I just want to make sure we got this clear. Who is he of Revelation 13, 11 through 18, and Revelation 16, 14? Who is he? Protestant America riding the government. So is that happening right now? All right, now watch this. Some people don't like the pioneers. I do. I like the pioneers. I study them because if it wasn't for their writings, because Sister White told us to study the pioneers, didn't she? Counsel to Writers and Editors, page 26, 28, and 31. She tells us to study the pioneers. She says those men knew what it took to dig for truth as gold. If we studied them, we, would not have, have, we wouldn't be attracted to all these new doctrines that have come into the church. That's what she said. I said, I cannot put every quote up here. Some of these things you're going to have to see. Counsels to writers and editors, page 26, 28, and 31. So who is he? Look at this. Pioneer writer A.T. Jones. Now, some people have a problem with A.T. Jones. I don't. Because Sister White told us that she had warned that they could be, they could end up under, under Satan's control because he was going to attack them. But that's another story. Now watch this. Now I want you to think about the evangelicals or the Protestant churches. I want you to think about this as he explains back in 1893. He says, how many of you have seen a Punch and Judy show? You know what Punch and Judy is? I'm going to show you in just a second. Many of the audience during that time held their hands up because back during that time, everybody had seen one traveling. They were like a traveling circus. He says, those little figures that work back and forth there, bobbing up and down and to and fro from above the curtain are manipulated by someone behind the curtain. You don't see him. This is what a Punch and Judy show looks like. You've seen those puppets, haven't you? Okay, it's a, puppet, it's a puppeteer show. Now watch what he says. Those little puppets that bob up there are exactly what these Protestant churches are today in the hands of the papacy. She is beneath, she sits behind the curtain, she works the wires, she touches the triggers. These Protestants in their blindness think they are doing great things for them, themselves. Is that happening today? But they are simply the puppets in the hand of the papacy working as she desires upon this government and through this government for all the world. Well over 100 years ago, 140 years ago, 140 years ago. Stephen Haskell says this in the, in the book Story of, the, Story of the Seer of Patmos. He says the beast and his image seek to control all nations. Are you seeing this now? If you don't vote with the United States, you are our enemy. Did you just hear that? This was just mentioned. Satan works in a way never before known. The principles which made Rome the most oppressive government are revived and strengthened. The miracle working power of spiritualism adds strength to the oppression. Paganism, the dragon, the papacy, the beast, and fallen Protestantism, the false prophet, join hands. Urged on by the unclean spirits, deadly decrees are issued by this threefold union. We're in that process. 
and Satan himself appears in person. The angels loose the winds of strife and marshaled by the great commander of the legions of darkness, the nations gather for the great battle of Armageddon. Hitherto, the hand of God has controlled in battle. His voice has said, thus far and no further. And although his hand was not recognized in the God, even heathen armies, this is a truth plainly shown in the wars of Israel, according, excuse me, recorded in the Old Testament. And so the Lord is holding things back while these the, the entities are trying to come closer and closer. And God allows a little bit to come. He allows a little bit to happen so you and I can see how close we are to the end. These events are to happen just before the end. And if these events are to happen just before the end, then Revelation 13, 11 through 18, we are just a couple of steps. And really, if, if it wasn't for those angels holding back, that's the only thing. Because everybody is on the playing field except for God's people. Every entity is in position except God's people. And when we look at this, and when we look at this, the, the, what is that, the feet of iron and clay? The feet of iron and clay. See, many people, because they don't see the papacy doing things out in the open, they think the papacy is not doing anything. But the Bible tells us in Daniel that those feet of iron and clay, what do the iron represent? Rome. And the clay represents statecraft. And so everything that you see, it's just like if you look at your own feet, you see your skin, but there are bones up under there, aren't they? Aren't they? And if you take the bones out, what happens to you? You fall. So it's the bones that are controlling, or it's, those, it's that iron in the clay that's controlling everything that's happening in the world. There's one superpower, and it is the papacy. We have been so indoctrinated or miseducated, we believe that the United States is a superpower. But all the countries don't come to the United States and pay homage to the president. They all go to the papacy and pay homage to the paper, to Pope, don't they? That's the world power. When Nebuchadnezzar told all the kingdoms to come, did, the, did he go to the kingdoms or did the kingdoms come to him? That's a world power. The papacy is the world power, brothers and sisters. And so she controls every single nation. How does she control every nation? The prophet tells us in Great Controversy, page 234, she says, 234, 235, she says, under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. You see that? Climbing up, climbing up to be the counselors of kings. Are they counselors today? Congress? Only? Congress, the Supreme Court, and the presidency. Do you know, do you know, brothers and sisters, what, what school that Donald Trump went to? No, close, very close. Second place to Georgetown. What did you say? Fordham University, number one Jesuit university. Georgetown is the number one Jesuit university for, for politics, but the number one Jesuit university is Fordham. And, and Donald Trump went to Fordham. That's another story. Another story. They became servants. Speaking of the Je Jesuits, they became servants to act as spies under their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people. And the children of Protestant parents were drawn into an observation of popish rights. And so back in the 1500s, the groundwork was being laid for the coalescing of all the educational institutions in the world, especially the Protestant institutions, by the Jesuits to counter the Reformation. It was anti-Protestantism. And the children of Protestant parents were drawn into the observation of public rights. All the outward pomp and display of Romish, Romish worship was brought to bear to confuse the mind and dazzle and captivate the imagination. And thus, the liberty for which the fathers had toiled and bled was betrayed by the sons. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe. And wherever they went, 
there followed a revival of popery. Wherever they went, did they come to the United States? Are they active in the United States? Are there Protestant schools in the United States? According to the prophet, have those Protestant schools been infiltrated by the Jesuits? So in other words, when you see evangelicals telling the Pope to do something, who is actually telling the Pope to do something? I'm excuse me, telling the president to do something. Let me rephrase that. When you see the evangelicals telling the president to do something, who is actually telling the president to do something? The Pope. But they don't know that they're speaking for the Pope. They're puppets. They're just puppets, beloved. And so they are false prophets. They cannot tell the truth because everything they have been taught is, again, rubbish and error. Do they have power or are they trying to get power? I want to just show you a couple of quick videos and I'm going to get out of here because I know my time is almost over. But I got to show you this because we have to understand that these feet of iron and clay, these feet of iron and clay are literally a sign that the, pope, the papacy has total control right now, right now in this world. And so when we talk about the evangelicals, this will be my last video before my last slide and then I'm out of here. We talk about the evangelicals and the power that they have. Remember they rose to become counselors to kings. That's what the prophet said, right? counselors to kings. I got this off of Democracy Now! and listen to this. I've been covering Mike Pence for um, God, almost a decade, uh, and my initial gateway into covering Pence is because he was one of the candidates that received the uh, most funding um, from Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, who uh, during the Bush Cheney years operated what amounted to a Christian supremacist neo crusader uh, militia. And uh, Pence was actually the, uh, the member of Congress that invited and welcomed and threw a party for Eric Prince in the aftermath of the Nisar Square massacre in Baghdad in 2007, when Blackwater operatives killed a dozen and a half um, Iraqi civilians, including uh, small children. Uh, so Pence sort of was on my radar because of uh, looking at who Eric Prince and his family uh, were funding. Uh, you, you, you look at, at Pence's evolution as a political figure, and in many ways it, it, it is the story of how the radical religious right uh, gained such prominence and now is in an unprecedented position to wield power. Uh, some may say, oh, well, wasn't George W. Bush the same uh, mentality? These guys are more extreme uh, than George Bush uh, on issues of religion, on issues of uh, uh, on immigrant rights, uh, on issues. I mean, they really make Dick Cheney look like a reasonable guy on some of these uh, policies. And in fact, Mike Pence says that Cheney is one of his uh, mentors and examples and, and whose footsteps he wants to uh, follow in as vice president. Combined, though, with a, a, a really radical uh, Christian agenda, Mike, their their primary uh, agenda on a social level is basically taking us back to medieval times when it comes to the rights of women, the rights of immigrants, uh, the rights of the poor, the humanhood of of uh, all of the, the these sort of vulnerable targeted groups. Uh, and you know, Mike Pence, his his personal history is interesting. He was raised in an Irish Catholic Kennedy Democrat household, and then he was converted on the spot at a Christian music festival uh, in Kentucky while he was in college. Uh, and he sort of now describes himself as an evangelical Catholic. Uh, but his sort of intellectual uh, role models within this, what I call a Christian supremacist world, are, are people like the, the, uh, the famed radical right-wing Catholic priest Richard Newhouse, who was an evangelical and converted to being a Catholic. Gary Bauer and James Dobson, you know, ferocious right-wing uh, anti-woman uh, activists. Uh, these are the people that sort of uh, populate the world that Mike Pence comes out of. And Pence has always been viewed as one of the prized warriors of the radical religious right uh, uh, with nuclear weapons. Uh, and being the most powerful economic force in the world right now, second maybe to China, uh, with this radical right-wing uh, Christian supremacist agenda. They want to wipe out Muslims. That's the clearest definition of a religious supremacy. You want to wipe out another people because of their religion. And, and 
Pence is in good company in the, you know, in the in the emerging cabinet in terms of uh, viewing Islam as an ideology that needs to be exterminated along with its followers. You understand? Right there, Pence's objective is to do what the evangelicals desire, and that is to wipe out Islam. That shows you what did the, what did the prophet said? They rose up to be advisors to who? Kings and princes, and who, he's an advisor to the president. Now I'm going to have to stop right here because this was just Sabbath lesson, and I'll finish where we see here. Does the evangelical church, does the evangelical church today in 2018 have control over the White House? Some of you don't sound like you're sure even yet. We're going to show you this afternoon. We're going to show you. How about does the evangelical church have control over Congress? And how about the Supreme Court? Yes. And you see who's behind the evangelical church? The papacy. We are right there. God is holding back the winds of strife for his people to achieve righteousness by faith. Until we achieve righteousness by faith, the prophet tells us the following. She says, the work that the church has failed to do in a time of peace and comfort she's going to have to do in the most discouraging and difficult circumstances. Gaining the righteousness of Christ now is the easiest it's ever going to be for us. From this point on, brothers and sisters, it's going to get harder and harder. And if we think that something's going to happen and be shine over the sky and tell us, oh, it's time to get your character together, that time is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And if it seem evil unto you that you will serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you shall serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us have a word of closing prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing your servants to see the signs of the times. But Lord, you know it's more for us than to just see the signs. We need to act upon it in our own sphere of influence, especially in our own lives. It's time for us to look in the mirror and see if we truly have the faith that was once delivered to the saints, that we truly believe that you can take a man who's so full of sin and make him more rarer than the goal of Ophir, that you can take a man and a woman and you can make them truly have the righteousness of Christ by imputing his righteousness, not just to when they were born, but even further to before they were even conceived. We pray that you will be with us and dwell with us on this Sabbath and that we will understand how close things really are. Order our steps again, we ask, in your word is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.